how do you even talk about having a health condition without saying I have this? You know, it's like it becomes a whole long sentence to just say, you know, I'm currently living with this, you know, but I believe that my body can heal. And that sometimes I say it that way because I, I actually cringe every time I say, you know, I have this diagnosis. So that's kind of one message that I love to share with people is just thinking about kind of the words that we use around that. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. I want to take a moment and explore the deep systemic problems that underlie women's experiences of feeling dismissed and ignored by the medical system. Too frequently, women have been discharged from the emergency room mid-heart attack with a prescription for anti-anxiety medications, while others with autoimmune diseases have been labeled chronic complainers for years before being properly diagnosed. Women with endometriosis have been told that they are just overreacting to normal menstrual cramps, while others have contested illnesses like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia that, dodged by psychosomatic suspicions, have yet to be fully accepted as real diseases by the whole of the profession. And women with Hajimoto's have been told that their thyroid lab panels are normal and nothing is wrong with them because the lab ranges are too broad to provide a definitive diagnosis. What does this all mean? Well, number one, we are not making it up in our heads and a lot needs to change in our healthcare system before we consistently receive the care that we deserve. In the meantime, that's why this podcast exists. I created this podcast so that you feel more prepared and ready to have tough conversations and advocate for yourself and to help give you the tools to start diving in and supporting your body naturally. There is so much that we can do every day to support our overall health and wellness. Now today I'm bringing on Lynn Del Mastro, who shares her story about being misdiagnosed with leukemia at the age of 25. After her experience, she has devoted her mission to sharing a powerful message that you are not your diagnosis and how to avoid allowing chronic illness to become your identity. Now, before we jump into this very powerful interview, I want to take a moment and celebrate you and your health victories. Now, one particular healing rock star is Angie, and I'm excited to shout out her win that she shared on iTunes about a month ago. Here is what she's had to say. I have been listening to Dr. Marisa's podcast for a while now. Each episode, I gain so much information to not only help myself through this season of my life, but to also help redirect my daughters into a more healthy, holistic approach from everything birth control to eating for your cycle. I know if we would have had this years ago, I myself am sure as many other women could agree that we would be in a much better place health-wise. Thank you, Dr. Marisa, for taking time each week to record two episodes, even when you're on vacation. And I know that Angie was referring to when I was on vacation in Europe back in the month of June. I believe her iTunes testimonial or shout out happened towards the end of June. And I love that no matter where I am in the world, I can make this podcast run And it's just my, I wouldn't even call it a labor of love. It's just the passion that I have to do this twice a week. So thank you so much, Angie, for recognizing that. And thank you so much for sharing your big win, not only for yourself, but also for your daughter. Understanding our bodies and how to create amazing health is what it's all about. And if you're listening, Angie, I would love to gift you and your daughter a Superwoman blend. So please reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram or whatever feels good for you, and we will get that in the mail ASAP. Now, I absolutely love shouting you out, and I can't tell you how much your message means to me. You can easily just connect with me, chat with me, DM me on Instagram or Facebook, 
Or if you would rather, it means the world when you review the Essentially You podcast on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you plug into. That way, we are changing the world by giving women solutions that they can use in their, at their fingertips and to provide them with the much-needed information for them to take to their doctors or practitioners so that they are getting the right type of care that they deserve. Now let's jump into this powerful and thought-provoking interview with Lynn, but first I want to sing her praises. Lynn DeMastro Thompson is a certified body talk practitioner, speaker, and author of the book, You Are Not Your Diagnosis. She holds his master's degree in somatic psychology. After being misdiagnosed with leukemia at the age of 25, Lynn became passionate about sharing with the world her message that just because a doctor has said an illness is chronic or incurable doesn't mean that it has to be a life sentence and that Western medicine isn't the only approach to healing. When we explore other holistic options, true healing rather than symptom management can occur. Well, amen to that, Lynn. I am all about that message. I would have to say that that is the underlying message of this podcast. I'm so excited to bring Lynn on. Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Lynn Del Mastro Thompson. How are you doing today? I am doing well. Excited to be here. I am excited to have you here. You know, when you reached out and you told me about your, your journey and your story and what you wanted to talk about, it felt so in alignment with what we've been discussing here on the podcast. Now, what we're going to be talking about today, because I know people are wondering what it is, we're going to be talking about the idea that you are not your diagnosis and how to avoid allowing chronic illnesses to become your identity. And this has been, this not only your life's work and kind of dialing into this, but you have a very profound story that connects into really just not being connected to that diagnosis. Can you tell me about your story? Sure. So my story kind of started in my mid-20s when I was in graduate school. I had been in a program for several years, and I was kind of miserable in that program, but I wasn't really listening to myself in that kind of acknowledgement of being miserable. And the summer of 2004, I was scheduled for elective surgery. And when I went in to have the pre-op blood work done and the surgeon got the results, he called me that night and he, it was the night before surgery. And he said, something looks really odd in your blood work. And I panicked, you know, to hear that. And he said, you know, it could just be a lab error, you know, don't freak out yet. Let's send you back and have them run the tests again. And so do that. And he calls me and he says, yeah, it's not a lab error. And I remember just that feeling of terror because as I said, it was elective surgery. It wasn't something that I, you know, had a health issue. I was actually supposed to have a breast reduction and going from feeling like, you know, here I am, this healthy 24-year-old young woman getting ready for the surgery I always wanted to being told there's something wrong. And of course, you know, he was just a plastic surgeon, so he didn't really know what was going on, just that he couldn't do surgery. And I went down this wormhole for a couple of weeks of seeing different doctors, seeing different specialists, being hospitalized, all to come to the diagnosis of leukemia at the time. And of course, that was a tremendous, tremendous shock to be told that you have leukemia. I was treated for that diagnosis for three years, had a hematologist who didn't really listen to me very well. I'm sure some people can relate to that, the doctors that don't really listen. I would spend probably a good hour in the waiting room and see him for maybe three or four minutes. He'd say, how are you feeling? And I'd say, I feel crappy. Like I just... I'm not well. And he would always say, well, you look great. I'll see you in a month or however long to the next appointment. And it was like, are you really listening to me? And I think deep down inside, I knew something was wrong. Like he kept saying, you know, your lab results are looking really good. Well, they were actually looking for something that wasn't there because it was a misdiagnosis of leukemia. And it took me about three years to finally get to see a different specialist because I had been asking for a referral to a different hematologist from my primary doctor for quite a while. 
And he kept insisting this was the best doctor. They had gone to medical school together. You know, just trust him. He's great. And finally, when I left graduate school and was able to get different health insurance and a different primary doctor, she said, yeah, I can refer you somewhere else. And that doctor immediately on looking at my medical records, looked at them and said, I don't think you have leukemia. I think you have something else. Hmm. And what was that moment? Like, how did that feel at the time? Had you been doubting a lot what was going on? This seems to be quite a bit of a roller coaster, kind of getting all kinds of misinformation. What did that feel like? It was so frustrating. You know, I went back, I had initially been diagnosed at UCSF in San Francisco, and I actually went back there to try and get them to like look at my case again as an outpatient. And I got there and that was another one of those medical situations. They had absolutely nothing in my chart. Not, it was an empty file folder. And I was like, I was in the hospital here for like a week. How do you not have a file on me? The appointment was like trying to fill in this doctor of like what my history was. And, and then she was, she was just kind of like blown off again of just like, oh yeah, you know, it, it's, well, you have leukemia, you know, like, what are you complaining about? And, you know, not having anybody really listen to me when I kept saying something feels wrong. You know, you keep telling me my labs look good, that things are supposed to have been improving. And yet I had gotten to the point I was wasting away. Like people would walk up to me and say, don't lose any more weight. Like you look like, you know, your skin and bones. And I was like, I'm not trying to lose weight. This is not like a weight loss plan. This is like my body being really sick and just shedding weight. Like I, I would eat, but nothing stayed with me just to feel like you just wanted to see, scream sometimes. Like, are you listening to me? Like would somebody, I, I knew at a certain point, like something was wrong. I didn't know if it was not the correct diagnosis or what exactly the problem was, but nobody was really listening to me. Oh my goodness. Tell me about that. So, I mean, I, I mean, this was, you know, a big part of a lot of the conversation we've had I've looked a lot at, clearly this happens, unfortunately, a lot in the, in the medical system, but particularly I find when it comes to women's specific conditions, we tend to just keep brushing it off, brushing it off, brushing it off. So then what was the next step for you? Well, once I finally did get a referral to a different specialist, they ran different tests and completely reevaluated my case. And as soon as I got a, a different diagnosis, and started receiving the correct care for that, it's like my whole life did change. Like I did start to feel better. I started gaining weight. I actually, during that time of being really sick, my period had gone away and it finally came back. So I could see like the health and the vitality returning to my body. And I think the other big part of my journey really was even in the midst of that incorrect diagnosis, I started to explore other options because I was just like, nobody here is listening to me. I'm not feeling better. And there have to be other things that I can do to help myself. Two things I wanted to unpack there. One, I can't even imagine the frustration of not being listened to or heard. How was it? Were you advocating for your health? Did you find that difficult to do? Tell me a little bit about that as well. You know, as you're getting sicker, you're getting misdiagnosed, doctors aren't listening, or at least it seems that they're not, or definitely they're, they're confused as to what's going on. When you started looking at other things, were you advocating for some of those other things? Or tell me a little bit about that. I think I wasn't really discussing some of those other things with doctors as much. I was just like, I'm going to do these things in addition to like now I'm totally open with my, my doctors and I will say, you know, like I'm also doing this thing. And, you know, I tell them about what I do for a living and how I help people. But at that point it didn't feel as comfortable and none of the things that I was doing, would there be like a, you know, a possibility of a medication interaction or whatever. So I'm like, I'm just going to start exploring these other options for myself. Got it. And tell me a little bit about those other options or kind of just because I know so many people are in this journey, very similar to you where they're getting, they're getting misdiagnosed or they're not getting diagnosed at all. I mean, so often I think what happens with women is that they're told they're not given a misdiagnosis that is kind of a scary diagnosis, like, you know, being told that you have leukemia, rather they're being told that they've got nothing at all. And there's, they're totally normal. There's nothing wrong with them and they just need to go home and 
lose weight and de-stress and you know manage their anxiety. So tell me a little bit about what were some of the integrative practices? I'm not sure if they were integrative, but what were some of the things that you were doing that were that felt right for you? What was that experience like? Is that the one thing that you felt like you could control? Just because I want to get a sense of that moment. Sure. So my process there started with going back to biofeedback. So back to a practice of being hooked up to sensors and being able to see what was like going on with my body, with my breathing, my heart rate, like all of these different kind of physiological processes on a screen. I had experienced that when I was actually 12 and my pediatrician sent me that, sent me there for migraines to kind of help with that because he had learned that that was really helpful. And at this point, I was like so anxious because my whole life had been turned upside down by the diagnosis. And so I thought, okay, let me start with that. Let me start with just learning how to like control my body a little bit, how to feel empowered in terms of when I'm really anxious, what can I do? Like, how can I calm down? And then about a year later, I started going to a therapeutic yoga class, which had been recommended by a therapist I was seeing at the time. And at first, that was kind of a funny thing. She recommended it. And I was like, well, you're therapeutic yoga for healing? Like, what is this thing? Because my exposure at that time to yoga was always like seeing it in a gym. And, you know, I'm like, that doesn't look like something my body can do right now. And she said, trust me, this class is very different. So I went and I just couldn't be happier that I had went to that class. It was so beneficial for me to just have a space to just be with my body in a different way. It was very empowering as well to just have a teacher who was really a healer and holding space for kind of me to experience my body in a positive way instead of feeling just kind of like I'm betrayed, I'm frustrated, my body doesn't feel good. It was like, how can I feel a little bit of good in my body through this process? And then that was, I kind of view those two things as like my little door opening up. And then I started realizing, oh, hey, there's like this whole buffet of all these other things out there that I can try. I tried acupuncture and then I started learning about energy healing and Reiki. And it was like this whole little kind of, oh, I'll try a little bit of this and a little bit of that. How about some of that? Mm, I love it. I love it. I want to shift gears a little bit because I want to talk a little, I wanted to just one, unpack kind of that journey for you and how so many people are feeling right now. But I also want to unpack the next part of this, which is the idea. And I think you, you definitely have seen it. I've seen it a lot in that I've worked with so many patients, thousands and thousands of patients where their chronic disease or chronic illness really becomes the identity of who they are. And I know I can speak a little bit to this. So about a year ago, I was I was diagnosed with Hajimoto's and it was right before I was in the middle of writing my newest book. My, I was getting ready to get my book out into the world. I got the diagnosis. It was really devastating for me, but I'll be honest with you. There was a little part of me that kind of put it and I didn't put it on the, I was still doing a lot of things for it, but I put it on the back burner for my book and it did this huge book launch. We got this book out into the world. It was really successful. And then on the back end of it, I was like, Oh yeah, I've got this chronic, autoimmune condition I got to deal with. And so it's never felt like a part of my identity ever. However, I do know that I need to give it its due and its respect if I'm going to get better, you know? And so it's that interesting place where I've kind of, I I mean, I've never identified, I mean, I tell my story so much because I want women to understand and, and, and to feel that relatable story, you know, that there's hope and there's possibility and, and there's always ways to get well. But there are definitely days where I'm just like, man, this kind of stinks that I'm having to deal with this right now, you know, and then other days where I'm just doing me and doing all the things and I don't really think much about it. So I can kind of see where, you know, people can get stuck with that identity, especially when they feel like crap, you know? So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, when I actually wrote a book with this title, You Are Not Your Diagnosis, because it spoke to me so strongly as a message for people that, you know, going through chronic illness, you know, one of the most powerful things to think about is just the words that we use, you know, when we say I have this or, you know, like I even think about people who have had cancer and it's like, I'm a cancer survivor. And then they wear it like a badge. Like those words are so incredibly powerful. You know, anything that we say I am or I have after it's like, we're claiming it. 
And yet I realized it's like, how do you even talk about having a health condition without saying I have this, you know, it's like, it becomes a whole long sentence to just say, you know, I'm currently living with this, you know, but I believe that my body can heal. And that sometimes I say it that way because I, I actually cringe every time I say, you know, I have this diagnosis. So that's kind of one message that I love to share with people is just thinking about kind of the words that we use around that. And the other is just, what do we believe about that? Like, does that become who you are? Like, is that how the people in your life see you? Because I remember that was a big part of my story. After that initial diagnosis, it was like everybody who would, you know, come over and visit or call me on the phone. It was like, my health was like the primary subject of every conversation, which felt really disempowering to me. I know people were coming from a really, you know, heart-centered place of like caring, but at the same time, it was like, oh, you know, there's Lynn with leukemia. I wonder how she's doing with the leukemia, the leukemia patient. And I know that's a common thing I've heard from many people that I've worked with is it's like people don't see you anymore. They see your label. They see your diagnosis. And so you're, you know, you're whatever autoimmune disease or your cancer or whatever that is. It's like whoever you were and all of your beautiful facets of, you know, mother or wife or friend, like all those things somehow seem to disappear and we just become this one thing, which is that medical diagnosis. And we can even take that on, right? Because it can just feel like, yeah, like I feel like crap all the time. So, you know, I am this disease instead of like really owning for ourselves. I'm more than that. Yes, you know, I might be currently living with this health challenge, but I am still all the things I was before. I am still all of those other identities. So true. Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with you. You're right. Once someone gets a really big diagnosis, we tend to connect that into what is going on with them or identify them in that way. As you've looked at this, and I haven't looked at this as much. I mean, clearly I've seen where it has crippled people in the sense where well, may not the right word, but it has maybe slowed down their healing processing because they are so connected and attached to that condition. What, what is the concern when a diagnosis becomes somebody's identity? Much of my work is based in kind of the quantum perspective, quantum physics. It's like you're collapsing that wave of possibility that something else could exist because you're identifying, I am this or I have this, and that's all that could exist for you instead of saying, well, that might be my reality now, but I also believe that that doesn't have to be my reality permanently. And I think that's where it comes in too with the Western medical system versus kind of other approaches. You know, Western doctors want to say chronic illness is just permanent and there's nothing we can do other than give you pharmaceuticals and just kind of keep treating your symptoms and managing things. And yet, I believe that that's not true. I believe there are other possibilities that exist. And I've seen people, you know, release certain diagnoses and that's not part of their story anymore. So if that becomes so anchored in your identity, though, it, it becomes a lot harder for the body and the mind to shift out of that. It's like, well, yeah, everything is going to configure to that reality of whatever the diagnosis is. Absolutely. It can be a struggle to kind of like lock into something or feeling like you're kind of stuck in that space. And, and you're absolutely right. We do shut the door for possibility. You know, what is possible in terms of, of healing? And it, it's really, I think it's a mindset and it's a belief mechanism. Talk to me about how we can shift our mind and our beliefs and how that has such a profound effect on our health. Because, I mean, clearly, I think that at least the people, the readers, the patients that I work with, they really are looking for the other side. They're really like, I'm going to get to the root of this. I'm going to get better. I know I've got that capability. How do we make sure that we are in that mindset? Like, for instance, for this particular working through, getting to that right place, you meet me on the streets, you'd never guess in a million years I was dealing with anything. I'm high energy. I show up in the world in a big way. I've never felt connected to something. I tell my story a lot because I think it helps women. I want that relatable piece. And the reason for that is like, hey, here's somebody who maybe has found themselves here, but oh my gosh, look at all these incredible resources where we can get to the other side of it. You know. And so talk to me about shifting that belief mindset and how that has such a profound 
powerful benefit in terms of our health. Just starting with that understanding of just how powerful our minds are. Um, one of the pieces that I put in the book is a chapter about placebo research because I got really intrigued by all of these studies that were really showing basically the healing power of the mind. And, you know, a lot of times it's not a medication or it's not a surgical procedure or whatever that's creating that result for somebody. It's actually their belief that it's going to help them. And so it, unpacking that for people, it's like, what do I really believe is possible for me? What am I thinking about this health condition? So part of it is starting to try and like track your thoughts and become aware of them. Sometimes it is getting some support around that because sometimes we have subconscious beliefs that are kind of running the show. And that's always a tricky thing to access on your own because they're subconscious, right? We're not aware of that little track that's running in the background. Oh, absolutely. We're totally not. And I, I always talk about, you know, that big aha moment when you realize that we're holding on to these disempowering beliefs, this kind of like this underlying mode of operation that's driving so much of our behavior. And that can absolutely be the same for when we're dealing with a chronic condition. I also think that a lot of what comes into play too, and I don't know if this is in the book, your book, You Are Not Your Diagnosis, is that we, especially women, I feel like we feel a lot of shame and blame for when we get a condition when we get, get diagnosed with a chronic condition and that we don't necessarily think that we're worthy of healing that we deserve to get better and i think that's a big piece that we've got to overcome as well we all deserve those healing miracles that we all deserve to get better and that it isn't that isn't our fault that this happened necessarily there's there's no reason to have blame and shame for it but to really love our body in a way that opens the door for better healing yeah. And I think that's one of the flip sides of all of the thoughts of law of attraction and things like that. People can sometimes go to that place of feeling like, well, I guess I attracted this into my life. Like I attracted this diagnosis. And then I think that's where that shame piece really can come in is feeling like I did something wrong. Is it, was it my thoughts? Was it, you know, how I cared for my body physically? Like, what did I do to deserve this? And I certainly don't want people to think that that's what I'm saying because I don't, I don't take that perspective. You know, we all are doing the best that we can. And sometimes we go back and we think like in my story, it's like, I wasn't listening. And I view looking back at what happened in my twenties as my cosmic wake up call. Like, okay, you're not listening to the fact that this is completely the wrong path for you. You're miserable. You don't want to do this. So I needed that illness to wake me up, but yet I wouldn't say, you know, I should feel ashamed of that. I was like, that's just what needed to happen for me to kind of finally get the message through my thick skull. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I have a feeling there's a lot of listeners right now listening to this episode and they're thinking to themselves, yes, it's great to hear that I should not be connected to my diagnosis, but I, it's a little bit challenging for me what can we start to do to shift the way that we feel or the shift our identity around this so that we can open the door for more healing options or more hear hearing miracles, just you know, attracting the right people and opportunities and practitioners into our life? One of the things I would suggest is just being open to different things. And it sounds like you have an audience that's definitely more on the side of trying alternative things, which is great, you know, because some people it's like, well, you know, I'm just going to stick with Western medicine, even though there's not a lot to do. But just being curious, I think, is one of the most powerful things we can do is like, I don't know, like, maybe that could be something that would help me. Like, if you feel you hear something and you're drawn to it, it's like, why not? Why not give it a try? Because most of the time, there's not a whole lot to lose other than maybe time and some financial investment, but it could be the thing that really shifts something profound for you. Absolutely. Well, you're absolutely right. My audience is all about the possibility of, you know, just integrative medicine, functional medicine. I mean, the purpose of this podcast is for women to become the CEO of their health, especially if they're not hearing what they're looking to hear inside of the doctor's office, right? We got to really, you know, it's, it's to empower women with the information to really make those decisions and to feel confident in those decisions. That can always, that can be hard sometimes. I'm sure you felt that when you were like, this diagnosis is wrong. 
And the doctor's like, oh, no, no, you've got leukemia. And you're like, no, I don't. You're advocating for yourself around doctors can be really a struggle. And, and that's why I was really happy to bring you on because you lived that, you were in that. And I wanted to give my readers a different or my listeners a different perspective. And I'm going to keep giving you guys what you need in terms of resources for opening the door to true healing miracles. Lynn, honey, where can we get your book? Where can we find you? So the best way to find me is my website, which is heartfirehealingllc.com. And there's a place there for the book, but it's also on Amazon as well, available for purchase. The title is You Are Not Your Diagnosis. Yes, I love it. And I'm going to have it in the show notes. It'll be in there as well. I'm going to be giving my audience as well two free chapters of the book, You Are Not Your Diagnosis. I've got the link here. I will lead them there as well. So I'll have the link to the book specifically, but I'll also have the link to this wonderful free gift that you have. Any other place that we can find you, my dear? I'm always active on social media, so you can find me on Facebook. My business name is Heartfire Healing, so you can just look for Heartfire Healing and find me that way. And that's another great way I try to post some resources and inspirational stories and all sorts of good stuff there. So it's a great place to follow me as well. Wonderful. Well, Lynn, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for not only coming on and sharing your story, but also opening the door for what's possible for us, especially when we feel stuck in those chronic conditions. Oh, it was a true pleasure. I loved our conversation. Absolutely, dear. Talk to you soon. Okay, thank you. Now, the one thing that I took away from Lynn's interview was the power of our mindset when it comes to being on this incredible healing journey. Even though there are moments when we can feel overwhelmed and super bummed, even at times devastated about our diagnosis, it's important to tune into the fact that our bodies are ripe for healing miracles. And I know it because I see it every single day. On this podcast, I have interviewed dozens upon dozens of practitioners who at one point were very, very sick, including my recent interview with Dr. Terry Walls, earlier this week. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to that inspiring episode, I want to encourage you to go and check it out right after this one. It is episode 110. Now, as I write this episode, I'm actually in Washington, D.C. with a meeting with a practitioner about my Hajimoto's to figure out some other root causes that we need to tackle together to get my body back on track. You know, every day I am inching closer to getting my body functioning at an amazing capacity. But it's a journey, and it's it's how we think about that journey that really dictates what's gonna happen down the line. I truly believe that. And as I have said earlier and throughout this podcast, there is so much that we have control over when it comes to our health, to how we dictate that health over time. Now, if you've ever wondered where to get started, to get more educated, this podcast is where it's at. Also, my newest book, The Essential Oils Hormone Solution, is an amazing resource for understanding your hormones and cellular function. Plus, I provide you with a solid blueprint to jumpstart your health in just 14 days. Every day, women reach out to me who are doing book clubs. And as you know, I'm actually in the middle of a virtual book club as we speak on Instagram and Facebook. But every day women reach out to me, they're doing book clubs, they're doing the 14 day hormone rescue challenges together and the results are amazing. So if you're interested in checking out my book, I'll have a link in. But also if you're interested in checking out Lynn's book, You Are Not Your Diagnosis, you will find it in my show notes for this episode or go to drmarisa.com slash episode 111. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and listening into the Essentially You podcast. Our next episode, I am bringing on a dear friend and fellow San Diego neighbor, Steph Gaudreau. We will be talking about how to embrace our bodies and owning our power. As I mentioned earlier, it's always my goal to spread the word about this podcast and shout out your wins. So please reach out to me if you are experiencing a win or you've had a transformation because of these episodes, let me know. I cannot wait to hear from you. Well, until the next episode, have an amazing day and amazing summer. Talk to you guys soon. Bye.